needed to do so. U.S. politicians love to assert that the United States has the best doctors, healthcare system, and medical technologies in the world. A certain unnamed ex-president who devoted four years to undermining not only public access to health care, but even the very idea of medicine and public health, and who weaponized health care in such a way as to use it as a more effective tool of race, class, and sexual oppression, loved to brag about U.S. medical exceptionalism, even as he designed, customly, the world's worst COVID-19 epidemic. But we know better, right? Traveling through professional circuits, we know that the US spends twice as much on healthcare, but has some of the worst health outcomes, such as infant mortality and life expectancy, quote, among developed and even some developing countries, unquote. But let's hold on there. Might nationalism, developmentalism, and their racialized underpinnings be equally coded in these seemingly critical statements? Is research by medical anthropologists and sociologists, STS practitioners, public health, and other researchers on how US medicine undermines health as a fundamental right in the United States and racializes healthcare um, potentially um, be um, itself um, subject of, of forms of critique that might be by badly needed? Um, here, um, I would say. My way of answering this question is to express my delight as the co-director of the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine at being able to introduce our distinguished lecturer today, Dr. Omar Aldawachi, noting that his lecture is co-sponsored by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Dr. Dawachi's remarkable and acclaimed book, Ungovernable Life, Mandatory Medicine and Statecraft in Iraq, provides the most robust, ethnographically grounded, and historically sophisticated response to that question that I know. Dr. Jawachi comes to us, uh, lamentably only virtually today, from Rutgers University, um, where he is Associate Professor of Clinical Medical Anthropology in the Department of Anthropology. For most scholars, listing pa past positions is simply an exercise, an exercise in the excess of discourse. But for Dr. Jawachi, the list is most telling. For years, he served as the co-director of the Conflict Medicine Program in the Global Health Institute at the American University in Beirut. Um, he was previously employed in surgery and emergency medicine at the Middle East uh, Hospital in Beirut. And before that was junior house officer at Baghdad Teaching Hospital. Now, what is remarkable here is not just the multiple forms of professional training, medicine, public health, in anthropology, the latter in the form of a PhD from Harvard, that underlie the succession of positions, but the intimate engagement with histories of building public health infrastructures, of military interventions, of conflict, and of post-conflict forms of national strangulation, displacement, and multiple national, not multinational, critique and inquiry that characterize his personal and professional trajectory. In Ungovernable Life, Dr. Dawachi traces the emergence, consolidation, and somewhat destruction of public health care in Iraq through its, um, through its um, emergence uh, and through its central importance in colonial, imperial, post-colonial, and uh, now put some uh, square scarecrows around all of these terms the global war on non-aligned statehood and state terrorism eras. Using a dialectical understanding of power that both engages but also exceeds Foucault, Dr. Dawachi analyzes connections and disconnections and contradictions between medicine, public health, power, state making, and unmaking as he explores forms of order and disorder through an optic of ungovernment, uh, ungovernability resolutely focusing on Iraqi specificities on governmental life also illuminates ways of making and unmaking the Middle East and illuminates issues that once again are crucial for critically engaging US and other Eurocentric health provincialisms. Now, what could be better to be uh, privy to the reflections and deep research of a clinician and public health professional, a doctor who both embodies and critiques 
the way that the figure of the doctor in colonial, post-colonial, and wartime Iraq crucially shaped understandings of modernity, modernization, citizenship, and its possi impossibilities. We follow a physician as he presses irrevocably up against the limits of what medicine and public health can do until adequately providing care required calling the entire system into question um, and stopping to say, what the heck happened here? How can we rethink things from the ground up? At that point, to discover medical anthropology and to reconfigure possibilities of medical history in as deep and robust a way as such physician historians as Warwick Anderson and Jeremy Green have done. The book consistently calls out third worldism, the idea that places like Iraq always had third rate health systems, drawing on this combination of professional experience, history and ethnographic inquiry to blast away easy stigmatizations. The book shows how deeply medicine and particularly the figure of the doctor was a driving force in producing different versions of modernity and state power. Ungovernable life is thus an original, painful, and highly sophisticated way of unthinking and rethinking not only questions of medicine and public health, but of collective life, medicine, care, conflict, and governance, and the state, not through easy deconstructions, but through an intimate view of both their possibilities and limits. It is small wonder that the Society for Medical Anthropology bestowed one of its two most prestigious awards, the New Millennium Book Award, on this book. Now, I'm not going to talk about his other publications, except to say that his portfolio of essays, articles, shows the real possibilities that what a physician who actually practiced as a physician, also trained in public health and in anthropology, can contribute to various audiences. He has publications in Middle Eastern studies, journals, medical anthropology, and quite a variety of medical and public health journals. His work and its impact clearly stretched beyond the borders of nation state, of discipline, and of analytic perspectives. And without further ado, I am delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Dewashi, whose title today is Revealed in the Wound, uh, Iraqi Bacter in the Biology of History. Welcome and thanks. Thank you so much, Charles, for this uh, incredible uh, presentation. I'm very honored and, uh, and and humbled by 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 this. Uh, your you, you know I've read your work when uh, when I was a graduate student and I've been I've been always uh, uh, inspired by it and uh, and it really gives me such a great uh, pleasure to be introduced by you that way. Um, uh, uh, and thanks for the Institute for inviting me and thanks for the Center of Middle East Studies. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm I'm really kind of uh, sorry that I couldn't be with you guys uh, in person and having this conversation together and uh, uh, thinking about uh, about some of the issues I'll be uh, presenting. Uh, but I'm hoping that this could be a, a kind of also as uh, generative and as exciting uh, a talk uh, as I have always hoped it to be. So um, what I'm going to be doing today, uh, I want to first um share my screen so what i'm going to be doing today is uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work that i've been uh, uh, doing in uh, beirut over the past uh, 10 years uh, i've moved to rutgers uh, two years ago, uh, coming from Beirut, and I guess I kind of left Beirut at the at a very interesting uh, time, just before the financial collapse and the Beirut explosion, that really changed uh, the the landscape of the city and has also changed the landscape of the university at the at its financial, um, emotional, and and even physical uh, aspects. So what I'll do today is to uh, give you a little bit of uh, uh, where I picked up from the end of the book. Uh, you know, this is this is the work that I kind of uh, picked up from the end of the book uh, throughout the past uh, decades and uh, giving you a little bit insight from my public health practice and uh, from the ethnography uh, on war injury that I've been doing uh, or that I've been conducting uh, in Beirut. Iraq, Syria, and across what I'm calling the east of the Mediterranean. And 
And basically, what I want to really show today is uh, is how uh, ethnographic work could open up uh, broader global health uh, questions, uh, specifically around issues of war injury and uh, antimicrobial resistance. Two themes that I'll be focusing on today uh, in my in my presentation. However, before I uh, start talking, I would like to show you a, a six minute clip uh, from a video uh, that will a little bit contextualize uh, some of the the storyline that I am uh, going to be presenting. Uh, what I'm also going to be presenting is something uh, could be seen as some kind of a, a medical mystery that maybe uh, we can think about uh, at the end of, uh, of the talk. So let me start with the, presenta the, the video presentation first. Along with all the problems that war brings, we're now facing a new enemy invader, emerging from Iraq. Each of its soldiers are packing weapons, dozens of them. These guys can survive for weeks at a time without food or water. We don't know how to fight them, but we've got to find out. Guns and tanks won't help us here, but as correspondent John Torres reports, what we really need is a good, biologist. There's a killer on the battle-torn streets of Iraq, but it doesn't carry a gun. It's attacking injured soldiers. With better armor and advanced medical care, they're surviving in larger numbers than ever before. I was a doctor in Iraq with the Air National Guard, and I can tell you from first-hand experience, the survival rate for wounded soldiers, it's a remarkable story but it's one with a downside. That downside comes in the form of a tiny microbe with a powerful punch. Here's the culprit. It's a bacterium called Bamanii, referred to in Iraq as Iraqibacter. It's named for microbiologist Paul Bauman, who researched it back in 1968. But even he couldn't predict what this tiny, single-celled organism would one day become. Like most bacteria, it lives in colonies and is constantly reproducing, simply by dividing and dividing again. A single bacterium can give rise to five billion trillion in only a day. This bug used to be relatively harmless, yet somehow it's found a way to transform itself into a drug-resistant killer. One of its many victims was ABC News correspondent Bob Woodruff. On January 29, 2006, while embedded with the U.S. 4th Infantry Division in Baghdad, his vehicle was hit by a roadside bomb. We have some breaking news to report. Our co-anchor of World News Tonight, Bob Woodruff, and his... To keep him alive, doctors had to remove part of his skull and induce a medical coma. Miraculously, Bob was stabilized and evacuated to Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. His wife, Lee, was there by his side. What was going on with Bob at that point? He underwent many different surgeries for different things, but I think that's the point at which they became nervous about pneumonia and, and sepsis setting in. And in fact, that was what had happened. A Baumannia infection had spread throughout his body, and he was back at death's door. It seemed impossible to me that someone could be in a war and be hit by a bomb and survive this and then be actually felled by a simple bacteria in a hospital. Bob Woodruff is just one of many soldiers and civilians picking up this deadly microbe in hospitals along the evacuation chain out of Iraq and bringing it back home to America, where it's infecting even people who have never seen a battlefield. It has this ability to hang around in places where it ought not, like on doorknobs and pillowcases and, and the like. Where it can survive for weeks. So why not simply use an antibiotic like penicillin to fight it? After all, haven't antibiotics been the magic bullet saving soldiers' lives since World War II? We saved a lot of people's lives. Penicillin was a wonder drug. But something has changed. Now the bugs are fighting back. Microbiologist Mike Smith demonstrates how drug-resistant this bug has become. 
you take baumannii and you put it on a plate containing imipenum. He places colonies containing millions of bacteria in several petri dishes and confronts them with imipenum, an antibiotic so strong it's nicknamed gorillacillin. After 12 hours, all the bacteria should be dead, but they're not. Unfortunately, this is the kind of thing that we're seeing where uh, certain colonies are surviving, and, and in this case, you can see a few in the middle there. Now, looking at it, there's only six or eight little colonies. These are the only ones that are living, so the entire population now of remaining bacteria are imipenum resistant. So this is the strain. Smith and graduate student Tara Janoulis prepare a sample of Baumannii. Its DNA will be sequenced one letter at a time. The results reveal that Baumannii has large sections of genes that don't belong foreign genes that are giving it resistance to antibiotics. There is a multi-drug resistance strain that took 45 different drug resistance genes and stuck them in one spot. This should be alarming because that's what this bug can do. How is this possible? There's only one way we get our genes, and that's from our parents. It's called vertical gene transfer. But it turns out bacteria can also get genes in a process called horizontal gene transfer. One way that happens is when two bacteria get together for a little friendly conjugation, the microbial form of snuggling. They form a connection and squirt DNA into each other. Turns out Baumannii has been getting a little too friendly. Could that be what's making it so nasty? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, so there's a lot in that video. Uh, we can begin with 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 talking about the kind of the forms of representation um, uh, about Iraqi Bacter and the name specifically, the moniker. But I'm gonna actually uh, avoid doing that, but and 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 take this idea uh, of Iraqi Bacter pretty seriously here. So, of course, as you saw, this is the, the problem of antimicrobial resistance uh, in uh, the uh, after the emerging immediately after the occupation of Iraq was a very uh, uh, interesting uh, issue that began really literally a, a few months after the, the invasion. And if we look at some of the statistics, uh, uh, actually, that come from the U.S. military, uh, it shows that uh, that the uh, imipenem resistant uh, Acinetobacter baumannii cases began to uh, emerge in 2003 and uh, kind of reached uh, highest uh, their highest level in, in 2011 uh, and continued uh, over the next few years until the Americans uh, withdrew from the country. Of course, the video doesn't give any insight on what's going on in Iraq or if this or where this bacteria is coming from. Kind of a, a, a it, it kind of uh, reveals some of these uh, limits of discourses of science and the and, and kind of the politicization or the depoliticization of uh, such a problem. But in the wake of this uh, event, there were many uh, reports uh, in the United States coming from major uh, newspapers and major media outlets uh, uh, decry uh, decrying the, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, bacteria and the, the, the different problems that it was creating from, uh, with this bacteria moving from Iraq to the United States. Of course, this is not a new phenomenon. Actually, uh, back, back, uh, antibiotic, antibiotic in general uh, is very much uh, linked to the history of war. Antibiotics were first introduced as a um, at the population level uh, during the Second World War, and since then we've been seeing uh, different forms of resistance uh, emerging with bacteria, mainly in relationship to the mass production of antibiotics, the overuse of antibiotics in uh, human and non-human uh, uh, populations. But in 2015, the, uh, uh, the WHO uh, released an, an important report uh, highlighting the, the focus on antimicrobial resistance. 
and showing that by the year 2050, if uh, and if we do not really respond properly, antibiotic uh, uh, resistant deaths will actually take over most of the leading causes of death, including diarrhea, uh, 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 road traffic accidents, uh, and and other uh, and other conditions. Uh, and the cost of that will be really tremendous uh, on the, on the populations and globally in terms of finances and ter in terms of uh, the burdens of disease. And then actually in the classification of this high level meeting of antimicrobial resistance released in 2016, classified different bacteria as uh, being kind of on a critical priority or high priority or medium priority. And there, there you, have, you had it, Acinetobacter was top of that list. Of course, to just give you a little bit of an anatomy of this uh, bacteria, the name Acinetobacter comes from the scientific Greek. And uh, Acinito, uh, which means non-motile rod, uh, uh, describes this, this, this gram-negative cocobacillus uh, that basically is, is a very slow and the sluggish bacteria. It doesn't move really that fast. And it, it has, so it, it kind of lingers around uh, for a long time in different kind of contexts. It is commonly found in the environment, it's usually in water and soil, and even in a benign form. Uh, however, it's, uh, it's a resistant form is notorious for causing hospital-based infections, and it accounts for around 2 to 10% of all gram-negative nosocomial infections in Europe and the United States. It is also notorious for acquiring antibiotic resistance, as we saw in the video, um, and, and there had been emergence of certain strains uh, that actually resistant, uh, it's, it has this pan-resistance, it's resistant to almost all available antibiotics. Uh, the only antibiotics that uh, uh, has been used recently when there is an emipenem resistant uh, uh, asymptobacter uh, has been antibiotic that has been uh, kind of uh, abandoned in the 1970s during to its uh, nephrotoxicity. And maybe that was a kind of the, uh, a, a silver lining that we stopped using it, but now it's back being used to deal with uh, Acinetobacter, but patients who receive that medication need to be under very strict observation in hospital. And actually there is a high uh, pot uh, potentiality of developing uh, renal failure amongst such patients. The, the other kind of issue, it's uh, also well known for this horizontal gene transfer. So it actually acquires a lot of resistant genes from other uh, bacteria like E. coli, uh, Pseudomonas and actually uh, distributes these resistant genes to other bacteria. So there's this whole interspecies uh, connections between this uh, this bacteria and other forms of bacteria that could cause also antimicrobial resistance. It's very well known for formation of a biofilm, which basically uh, allows bacteria to stick to each other and exchange uh, information, exchange. Uh, uh, inf uh, data and ideas about resistance and uh, and what to be resistant to. So, so there's a kind of a sharing system, a communication system going on. There is also some research that, that the New Delhi uh, chromosome, the NDM1, had or originally originated uh, from Acinetobacter, though this is not really confirmed uh, in the scientific literature. Uh, the problem with this bacteria, as, as was said, it lingers on hard surfaces for a really long time, sometimes up to 20 days, uh, and it's also very much highly associated uh, with uh, dirty and open wounds and fractures. So it's seen a lot, these epidemics of this, uh, uh, of this antimicrobial resistant bac uh, bacteria happens a lot in war settings and in disaster uh, settings, and it's also very much seen in a lot of ICU units, uh, especially lingering on respirators. And, uh, and now actually with the, with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, there has been new reports of uh, the emergence of this bacteria in several ICU units across the United States and, and different parts of the world. But, and I'll come to this in the end of my talk. So, so one of the things that, that when I became aware of the story uh, was I began to ask the question, what is Iraqi about Iraqi Bacter? So 
it, going beyond the, the representational problems and the, um, the discourses, I wanted to really take this issue seriously and try to figure out uh, 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 this, you know, to understand a little bit, uh, to take this question a little bit as a rhetorical, but take uh, this uh, ac ac uh, accusation kind of seriously. So my background, uh, uh, as Charles did a very excellent job in telling it, I, I was trained in Iraq as a physician in the 1990s. So I started my medical training uh, during the uh, beginning of the, uh, the first Gulf War. And over my medical training and my work as, a, as a, an intern in Iraq or as a, res as a resident, uh, I witnessed the collapse and the uh, of the of the healthcare system in Iraq and the infrastructure and and uh, experienced the 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 kind of the rapid deterioration of one of the leading healthcare systems in the region into a uh, the, the disaster that it is that continues to be it at this at this uh, present day. This is the hospital that I worked uh, in, which is basically uh, uh, looks over the Tigris River and it's the largest. Uh, a medical uh, hospital or kind of a, a, a kind of a different uh, it's a kind of a, an assemblage of different hospitals dealing with different specialties uh, in Baghdad and it is actually the main referral center uh, from across the country and of course some of you may uh, uh, you know know this uh, the story Iraq was was uh, 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 invaded Kuwait the US with 33 countries bombed Iraq for 33 days uh, and uh, for actually 40 days, sorry. And after that, there were 13 years of uh, one of the harshest sanctions imposed a, on a country in modern history that caused a lot of uh, uh, grievances, a lot of deaths and a lot of morbidities and mortalities, specifically among women and children. Infant mortality in Iraq doubled during the 90s and maternal mortality also doubled during the 90s. However, after the 2003 uh, U.S. occupation, there was a kind of a new discourse emerging about Iraq that is uh, related to Iraq's ungovernability. And, and I became very interested in this uh, story of the ungovernable Iraq and again tried to figure out where this discourse come from and how we can understand it in relationship to a history uh, of state making and the history of foreign interventions and history basically of empire. So uh, one of the things that I, be, I uh, did uh, for my first uh, uh, project, uh, partly my dissertation, but then also later on my book project, was to trace this notion of ungovernability back to the kind of the colonial pathologies that emerged in Iraq uh, during the uh, British occupation in 1917, during the First World War, and the kind of uh, uh, medical ailments that emerged uh, with, uh, amongst the uh, uh, British military during that period. And, and, and what I tried to show uh, uh, how uh, medicine and health and these pathologies became so central to the political uh, will and the political uh, project of state making in Iraq and how, and this was why medicine was so central to the project of, of statecraft. So in the book, what I tried to really uh, trace uh, this genealogy um, uh, of the present breakdown of state infrastructure situating Iraq uh, not only as a kind of a country that exists as a nation state but actually part of a transnational history of medicine and empire and what I kind of one of the ideas I developed is this notion of mandatory medicine uh, uh, as a as an alternative to the what I read in the Middle East uh, uh, literature on Iraq and the um, and the political science literature on Iraq specifically that saw Iraq only through the lens of the authoritarian regime and the uh, political oppression of the Ba'ath Party. So I tried to show really how there is other modalities of power, uh, other ways of thinking about the history of the state through looking at medicine specifically as a central platform and, 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 and focusing on the doctor as a, a figure of that history. The the uh, the story of the doctor uh, start it starts in Iraq or starts maybe with the British uh, uh, kind of arrival in Iraq in the book, uh, but then also follows uh, the Iraqi doctor back to the United Kingdom, trying to be integrated in the national health uh, system after the 1990s with the exodus of almost half of the country's uh, medical force. 
so in many ways, I was trying to look also at, at the NHS system, the National Health Service system in the UK, as a, as a kind of a post-colonial system between two brackets, uh, to, and thinking this relationship uh, of the center and the periphery, because the NHS is actually mainly populated by doctors coming from overseas, from India, Pakistan, Iraq, uh, Egypt, countries that had been previously occupied by the, uh, by the United Kingdom or by, by Britain. And as, uh, uh, as Charles mentioned, one of the central uh, analytics of the book is this idea of ungovernability, uh, taking it as, a, as both of an analytic as a method, tracing the uh, how biopolitics uh, became enmeshed in this disordered operation of power, this unraveling of biopower producing that which it disavows. And of course, one of the uh, central ideas, mainly responding to this uh, post-occupation moment where I found to be so difficult to, to uh, limit and understand, is to set a stage because there was no real ethnographies of Iraq. The last ethnography uh, of Iraq was in the 1950s, or at least kind of a published ethnography was, uh, uh, was in the 1950s. So this was a completely new terrain to explore uh, from a country that has been kind of closed down to or, or closed off I mean to a lot of social scientists coming uh, from the outside so in 2011 I uh, after finishing my PhD uh, and spending some time as a postdoc in Canada I arrived in Beirut really at the at the um, beginning of the Arab uprising that really transformed uh, the past decades uh, across the region and I guess we're now almost going through a, a, the the 10 year anniversary of these uprisings and it's literally when I arrived in Beirut and 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 what I really uh, was surprised by or at least something that uh, uh, became very clear and I spoke a little bit about it in the book uh, is the number of Iraqi patients coming to Beirut for uh, treatment uh, mainly for uh, cases of uh, injury or cancer uh, or broader general uh, medical problems. Uh, so uh, I, I met a plastic surgeon uh, with the name of uh, Rassan Abu Sitta, and we both began this uh, interesting exploration of, uh, of uh, the story of uh, uh, healthcare access of, on this medical migration uh, of patients from uh, Iraq, from Syria, uh, from other countries in the Middle East, across different therapeutic hubs. Uh, and specifically, uh, we, what my work became uh, defined around is this idea of the wound. Uh, and the wound uh, as something that has kind of a long history in Iraq, in Iraqi literature and art, but also something that is used a lot uh, by many Iraqis to describe the, the grievance of a place that has kind of, uh, uh, that shaped that's been shaped by war and conflict and by, by, by violence, by authoritarianism and by civil war. But also this all becomes very blurry when, when the problem becomes also about a very uh, literal wound. And, uh, and this is something that we saw in Iraq. I guess many of you uh, saw this uh, during, the, the, uh, during the American bombing of the country, the occupation, the suicide bombing uh, that uh, defined the Iraq for, for a really long time, and also the ISIS war. So, so, war. so war wounds became almost like an endemic problem in the country. And what we try to, what I try to do, and with, with my colleagues, is to document these therapeutic travels of these injured patients, um, uh, and these what what I try to show that these traveling wounds uh, uh, kind of capturing capture these forms of displacement and movement across the region, defining these uh, uh, defining a, a new uh, this kind of east of Mediterranean uh, region and relationship to healthcare breakdown, but also the emergence of these therapeutic hubs in Beirut, in Iran, in Turkey, in, and also all the way to India. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were kind of leaving every year, uh, hundreds of thousands, almost 150,000 were leaving every year to, to seek care across the country. So analytically, the wound became a very interesting problem and looking at this, uh, this idea of the social, the material and the symbolic uh, questions of the wound. And, and one of the things uh, using the wound as a method to trace these problems is to ask the question, what is revealed in the wound? And I've, I've 
published a couple of pieces in relationship to thinking a little bit more on the uh, idea of the social wound and also on the wound as a methodology or as a method to 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 open up these multiple questions uh, and in in uh, over the uh, over the past uh, the past few years and i'm continuing to kind of develop this as as my second hopefully my second manuscript uh, uh, over the next uh, the next uh, few years uh, so one thing to, to uh, this this idea of uh, of the number of Iraqi patients coming to the American University of Beirut, where I uh, I worked, was increasing by the years. Especially, we can see this kind of increase happening from 2006 2007, and this is the year of the the counterinsurgency operations uh, in Iraq and the uh, increase in uh, in the violence and the proliferation of violence and what they call what was called eventually the uh, civil conflict or the civil war in Iraq and this kind of work uh, ended up uh, in uh, in uh, in a very interesting article in the Lancet that got a lot of uh, attention uh, defining this idea of of therapeutic geographies uh, across this region and this is kind of was our way to uh, to critique some of the some of the ways uh, public health was looking at healthcare in conflict settings, mainly looking at the uh, at the state health system versus the the refugees or the refugee camps. So we tried to kind of uh, show that there that by looking at the mobility of patients and how they move, we can see different other patterns at this kind of regional level. And and recently, uh, uh, I we came up with uh, I came up with this uh, I guess edited a special issue in uh, uh, Merip that tried to look at this past ten years of work and this is a picture of my colleague Hassan Abu Sitta who is uh, originally from Gaza and he where you know he would go there uh, whenever uh, uh, kind of war erupts and he's a very well known war surgeon a reconstructive surgeon working there so both of us became the 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 co the co founders and the directors of this conflict medicine program, which what we hoped to bring in a lot of social science, uh, history, epidemiology, and clinical medicine uh, as a form as some kind of a form of a social medicine from uh, the global south, focusing mainly on, on conflict and the wound as a way to, to think about these all these different medical, social, uh, economic and environmental problems. And we partnered with uh, Doctors Without Borders and we we did a lot of projects with them. I mean, I'm happy to speak about that maybe in the Q&A. And working with MSF was very interesting, partly because we also looked at some of these uh, humanitarian hospitals that uh, defined the region. MSF established its first uh, reconstructive surgery hospital in Amman in response to the war in Iraq, basically to treat Iraqis. They couldn't actually do this work in Iraq at that time because of the, uh, the security situation. So this hospital began small with about 70 beds and expanded now in 2015. They opened a new one which with about uh, almost double the beds. Uh, and in 2017, uh, uh, they began also introducing a different kind of uh, uh, therapeutics and that in this hospital patients would spend an average of four months uh, going undergoing different uh, surgeries and also um, uh, dealing with all the kind of rehabilitation so there was this kind of emerging therapeutic community and with the eruptions of war of the war in Syria and in Yemen more patients from these other countries were also coming in uh, to this hospital However, one of the things that kind of brought my attention to this uh, antimicrobial resistance was a, a kind of an interview with one of these, uh, with one of the surgeons in at the American University, who who was who was explaining to me how surprised he was that that a lot with though with the high number of Iraqi patients uh, uh, presenting with these. Um, uh, superbugs uh, and uh, and many of the cases coming in to be treated at the hospital were. Uh, were dealing with antimicrobial resistance. Almost half of the cases of injury presented with antimicrobial resistance. And, and in time, what we realized with the eruption of conflicts in, across the region that the, there was uh, the, the problem of antimicrobialism was spreading uh, uh, across all these different conflict zones. So from Gaza to Mosul, we began to see all these different superbugs uh, emerging in, uh, in these war settings and many of the wounded uh, had 
uh, to be deal. I mean, many of the healthcare uh, uh, healthcare workers and the different kind of civilian hospitals uh, were be dealing with with this problem. And and actually, uh, some of these problems, or at least some of this coverage, uh, was uh, instigated by us. And we we began to kind of speak to a lot of the media uh, outlets about this, just to bring more attention to this issue. Uh, and. And, and, and it began to really be, become clear that war and, and AMR were very much linked and entangled in the uh, across across the region. However, when we look at the kind of the broader uh, health uh, discourse, or at least these uh, action plans, we see that war really doesn't occupy any of this uh, uh, any of this discourse. A lot of the focus. Uh, of the these action plans uh, are re revolve around the notion of uh, antibiotic stewardship, the idea that you know we have to optimize the use of antibiotics and deal with uh, antimicrobial agents by by regulating antibiotics. However, from this ethnographic from these uh, from the ethnographic gaze, multiple observations emerged. That one that multidrug resistant Acinetobacter bomanii had emerged as a global threat after the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Change, there has been a changing nature of contemporary conflicts and there has been a failure of reconstruction that had led to the collapse of uh, infection control in civilian hospitals and the movement of these wounded across the region. I'm just kind of recapping some of these observations. And what is really interesting about the, these new conflicts is that previously, at least, let's say from the Iran-Iraq war, uh, war. Um, uh, uh, war medicine or conflict medicine is very much related to the work of the military. However, what we began to see uh, uh, that civilian hospitals were dealing with something very new to them, especially in Iraq, even in Syria and in Lebanon, with in war injuries that uh, that they that even the students trained in the medical school were not necessarily equipped to deal with this. Of course, the use and abuse of antibiotics during wars and sanctions were also a very important factor. When I was a medical doctor, when, and this is like something that uh, that kind of was informed by my own experience, that the, the there was a, a major transformation in the way we cared for wounded patients. We began in the 90s, we began giving patients three antibiotics to cover all kinds of possible infections, even if the patient didn't present with, uh, with any kind of signs of infection. And that basically was a way for us to prevent the development of infection. Little would we know that this would eventually end up uh, being a, a major stressor or environmental stressor on the bacteria that, that could be driving such resistance. The other kind of important uh, observation is that uh, the chemical milieu of war uh, and its relationship to AMR. Uh, we began seeing a lot of interesting literature in industrial settings and in agricultural settings where where antibiotic uh, resistance is emerging from the uh, from the contamination and the toxicity of heavy metals in water and in uh, soil. And these things, uh, many conflict zones are very well known to be highly contaminated with, uh, with heavy metals uh, used in ammunition, used in all kinds of uh, uh, military uh, arsenal, but also from the breakdown of the lived environment, uh, from cement, uh, sel uh, selenium exists in cement, that's a heavy metal that actually kind of seeps back into the, uh, the, the soil and the water. And with the absence of any kind of cleanup uh, by the, the invading forces, uh, these issues linger and continue to impact the environmental, the, what we have called the ecologies of war, or this, this war ecology in, in the way, it, and it's shaped, shaping eventually this uh, higher resistance problems in, uh, in bacteria. Um, uh, the other uh, uh, the other issue there is a, this kind of uh, what, what we what we've noticed that this tendency to look at this problem of AMR as this kind of homogenous problem rather than seeing it as a as a relationship to you know what Margaret Locke would call a local biology uh, seen only through this use and uh, and misuse of antibiotics. Uh, rather than actually seeing it through uh, uh, broader processes of war uh, that that has kind of shaped the uh, this ecology, uh, when when this when a lot of these realization happened, I reached out to some of my uh, anthropologists and colleagues. Uh, uh, 
and and we developed a, a kind of a working group, uh, the War Antimicrobial Resistance Asymptobacter Bomani WAMRA working group, for the lack of a better acronym. Uh, and and this included uh, uh, groups from uh, from a lot of uh, different backgrounds: microbiologists, uh, geneticists, uh, uh, historians of science, uh, uh, medical anthropologists, the clinical epidemiologists. We all began to work on developing a research project around this idea, trying to 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 investigate how war and uh, to try to produce empirical. Uh, uh, data around this idea that war is driving this antimicrobial resistance. And we did this really uh, incredible interdisciplinary uh, uh, proposals, and we applied for two major uh, fundings, uh, one with the uh, Department of Health in the UK and the other one with the ERC, and both of them uh, uh, actually failed. And, you know, we, we I mean, you know, we, it, it was one, it was a very ambitious project, very creative, but there was a kind of a reluctance of funding a project uh, such as this one. This, the work that we've done also revolves around the, the idea uh, that uh, historians of science, uh, Hannah Landeker, who's one of, uh, who's a, a, a very important member of our group, has kind of developed in her work on antibiotic resistance and the biology of what she calls the biology of history. So, uh, so this is a, really a kind of a, in a conversation with uh, what has been called the Anthropocene, uh, the way that the production of antibiotics uh, over time uh, the, and the human activity has registered uh, these uh, uh, changes in the bacterial uh, uh, in, in the bacterial material, and and what we see today in terms of resistance is a byproduct of human activities. This is kind of what she uh, brilliantly describes as the as the biology of history. So the two working hypotheses that emerge from this work is that heavy metals, particularly in conflict settings in the Middle East, is driving uh, global antibiotic resistance. And the second one is that decades of war and sanctions and the collapse of healthcare have been driving this evolution of antimicrobial resistance. And we began to kind of do uh, systematic reviews and uh, to look at the uh, the relationship and to kind of just at least set the ground for uh, this work. We're constantly meeting and trying to figure out how to do this work. Um, uh, this is something that I'll, I'm now working on interviewing a lot of uh, Iraqi physicians from the period of the 90s and the, and the post-occupation uh, around antibiotic practices, antibiotic use practices. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that kind of... Uh, uh, Develop uh, we, th that was a discovery in this project is we found there's almost 2,000 isolates of Acinetobacter bomani going back to the 1960s in one uh, f uh, refrigerator at the American University of Beirut. And we are currently in the process of uh, doing uh, phylo uh, phylogenies uh, of this of this uh, of this uh, historical uh, archive to see how we can actually relate. Uh, certain kind of political historical events to uh, certain kind of genetic events that might be seen. Of course, there's a lot of problems with that, but but the at least the hypothesis here is that uh, is that the idea that this ph ph phylogenetic analysis could give us some insight into the transformations that are happening in the bacteria in relationship to these major events. So so coming here to the end. Uh, that is is Acinetobacter, can Acinetobacter seen as an archive, as, as something that, you know, in a place like Iraq where where uh, a lot of the archives got destroyed during the war, can can this kind of biological matter give us an insight about the, uh, the, uh, the gravity of war and what it could do to uh, human population, to the environment, and, cha and this changing ecologies uh, of course, in the re in recent years, this the problem uh, with uh, of of AMR has exploded with COVID nineteen, mainly because there's so many patients uh, entering uh, into the ICU using respirator res uh, respirators, and most of the deaths actually that I know of in Beirut and in in uh, Mosul or in other these hospitals are mainly that many of these deaths although attributed to COVID, but then, but they actually are tested to COVID negative, uh, uh, but mainly died from, uh, from septicemia, from antimicrobial resistance. 
Um, so from in conclusion, from bombing campaigns to sanctions to full scale invasion to the so-called war on terror, Iraq has been at the forefront of Western interventions over decades, which have changed the very ecosystem in which people live. Despite this racial and uh, overtones of linking a bacterium to Iraq, asking what is Iraqi about Iraqi Bacter, Bacter unravels links between decades of war and interventions and the increasing prevalence of antibiotics resistance in Iraq and other conflict zones across the region. In such context, Iraqi Bacter may be the culmination of many things. The decades of militarization and wounding, the collapse of infection control and infrastructure, the movement of injured across the region to seek health care, the overuse and misuse of antibiotics the, driven by sanctions, the proliferation of poor quality drugs and counterfeit medicines, and the destruction and contamination of natural and lived environment, all define toxic legacies of decades of war that are endured in the wounds and bodies of Iraqis and their care projects. Thank you very much. Well, let me at least be your one visible audience member who can give you a round of applause for that really interesting and amazingly far reaching talk. Um, thank you so much. I'm pleased to say that you have a Q&A function there um, on the webinar screen and we invite you to please um, post your questions um, and I would be glad to um, please to read them if you'll uh, offer them now. I mean one quick thing we uh, while folks process so much interesting information is what is your idea about what really scared the potential funders about this fascinating um, incredibly politically, socially, and medically significant problem that um, that led them to uh, turn a, a blind eye? Um, I think, I mean, I think there are two reasons, and, and one of them is how ambitious the project was, I think, uh, that this was a real interdisciplinary project, bringing environmental scientists, laboratory scientists, uh, epidemiologists, historians, and, and social scientists. Um, I don't think any of these organizations were uh, courageous enough to uh, to take that risk, and they thought that this 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 uh, this is also a very uh, high risk project. Uh, although we are we argue that this is a high risk, high reward, um, but uh, I think that is one of the definitely the reasons. Uh, you, if you if, when we looked back at the at the projects that were funded, it it kind of you know was the uh, the usual suspects. You know, very straightforward uh, uh, projects. You know, examining uh, AMR in a in a in, in agriculture, examining AMR in this setting or that setting. This was a little bit uh, uh, too uh, uh, too ambitious. Uh, the the other issue I think I think even if this was not necessarily an institutional um, uh, kind of mandate or at least this was not an institutional politics issue I think people were reluctant to delve into such a problem I mean I mean think about it uh, Charles if you prove that these kind of war processes are producing these human uh, atrocities uh, at the level of disease, this actually kind of goes all the way directly into the Geneva Convention. And this could actually change, it could be a, a game changer in terms of uh, uh, waging war in general. Because if, I mean, I know this is a kind of also sounds a little bit too ambitious from our side, but at least the kind of the subtext, the, the invisible thing that we were kind of hoping for is that there is a kind of a broader uh, highlight of, of what war could do uh, not only at the level of mortality or, you know, like uh, these were, uh, uh, what do you call them, um, uh, uh, you know, these kind of bystander casualties, but then actually the whole war uh, is an environmental event. It changes not only uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the infrastructure and, the, and creates dead and injured, but it actually changed the whole environment or the ecosystem uh, under 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 uh, under which people kind of live and dwell and creates these problems that end up being much broader global health problems so 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 i think there are many reasons i mean you know i i think uh, now what we're doing we've kind of fragmented the project into different parts and then each of us 
each subgroup is dealing with with trying to figure out how to to answer some of its uh, uh, questions. Fascinating. And I, the one thing I would predict is that the book that comes out of that project is going to be just as stimulating um, as your first. So we it's do definitely have a lot going to be more ethnographic. This one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, we have a lot of questions now. Let me begin with one by an anonymous uh, attendee. I'm curious how you'd imagine Iraqi Bacter from a disability studies perspective, that some Iraqis are disabled by this antimicrobial resistance as a result of war and other factors? Right, right. This is a great question. Uh, I, think, I think one thing to, uh, uh, I mean, the Iraqi disabled population, in Iraq, there's a long history for disability. So, so from the Iran-Iraq war, and I've kind of written a little bit about this, but from the during the Iran-Iraq War, the state uh, created a kind of an incredible uh, political value to these wounds that uh, the, of the soldiers, and this is kind of you know classical story of of states that wage war and kind of try to uh, uh, reward its soldiers or at least its injured soldiers. So there was a kind of even a creation of these towns in Baghdad around disability. And and uh, and uh, there's a compensation for those who are wounded. But then with the with the 2003 uh, occupation, the political system shifted, and the new political elites in the country uh, who came in changed the va this political value of these uh, of these wounded. Uh, one way that those who actually uh, served during the Iran Iraq war were seen as some kind of traitors because the new political elite was very much uh, in uh, the kind of the, the political elite were were very much um, uh, kind of have, had strong connections with Iran and many of them actually as opposition lived in Iran and had and had a lot of Iranian connections. And the, so there was a changing of that political value of the wound. So what I've been writing about is how this, uh, how uh, kind of the cause of the injury, if you were, if you're uh, injured by the Americans, for example, uh, you most probably would not get uh, uh, government compensation because you're seen as like a terrorist or, you know, why would you be injured by an American uh, sniper if you were not uh, involved in some, uh, and some uh, uh, dubious activities. While those who are, let's say, injured in a suicide bombing, uh, uh, they received funding and actually received uh, money to go abroad and, and deal with their, with their injury. So there's, there's a whole um, uh, uh, economy or, uh, around, a uh, wound economy in Iraq that defines how people seek care and who is allowed to seek care and this and this idea really kind of created also more sectarian uh, tensions in the country because you know most of the uh, sunni population who were attacked by by uh, the the government and by the by the americans uh, received less funding and those let's say the shia population who maybe were injured by these uh, suicide bombings Kind of got a, a different kind of uh, different kind of treatment, so 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 I think on the long run there now there is now a kind of a more attention to this. There, also, a lot of the political parties began investing in supporting its members who got injured to to get uh, uh, to get uh, care from outside Iraq or get give them compensations. So there is a whole economy, I guess, around wounding. And if we kind of think about it in terms of the disability, history, the kind of the future in Iraq, I mean, it is going to be a very, very important uh, question that uh, the state will need to reckon with there, uh, mainly because of the rise of this population. Um, the other element is that you have members of the same family. So, I mean, I've interviewed I've interviewed an entire family that got injured because they were kind of in an outing, and and there was a uh, there was a suicide bombing, and then all the family was was impacted. And then you see within that family uh, the kind of prioritization: who gets who gets the first treatment is it the kids or is it the husband because he's the breadwinner so there's a lot of these negotiations that happened and i think there is a kind of an a big opening to think and to contribute to to disability studies uh, through looking at uh, these questions of war and i think there has been really some some incredible studies on the region um, uh, that deals with with some of these issues that was remarkable frankly that was an article that you gave us in response to one question. Just excellent. So this is from someone whom, whom you know, Vincent, my colleague at UCSF. Hi, um, Vincent. 
Terrific talk, Omar. How do you respond to those who want to know how this works in relation uh, to other hospital multi-drug resistant infections in other places, like the problems of staff in many US hospitals? Is this just a story of separate but not equal? Um, well, I mean, it's, I mean, I think I might need a little bit more uh, uh, context in, uh, to what Vincent is referring to. But I think, I think, I think the story, I think the idea here is that one thing that we're seeing, there is a global problem. We're seeing this problem, I think, across uh, the world in many different uh, places. And I think in, in time, what we will be seeing, uh, and these are not predictions or anything, but this is kind of a, a reality that one ethnographically one is beginning to see, is that hospitals, specifically, I guess, in the Middle East, are becoming very dangerous places. Uh, for 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 care uh, in Iraq, there has been kind of a couple of uh, the New York Times published a uh, an article about stigma and uh, you know they loved using these kind of cultural stigma issues in uh, about COVID and that many Iraqis are resisting to go to the hospital, but but what. But what really uh, that in people's consciousness, they they uh, people's experience, they know that the, when you enter the hospital, you don't come out. The same thing is happening in Beirut, uh, and I think what we are seeing now is that AMR and 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 I think there are different uh, uh, kind of local histories, let's say, or regional histories in relationship to a global history that is defining uh, defining AMR at the global level that is that shows us different uh, manifestations of this problem uh, and I, and i think one of the things that i'm trying to show is not to say that war is this is not a kind of a a, a, a separate place uh, these are uh, these are problems that are also emerging from these interventions these are problems that are being uh, that are may, may, be, may be happening in Iraq, but they've been taken back into the United States and actually across all the evacuation lines. Um, uh, but I think this this one bacteria uh, is one of many other bacteria that are causing these problems, and, and this is really happening at many different uh, uh, infectious disease levels. So I think what we are seeing uh, is is a kind of a, a global story, but it's just beginning to happen in these different uh, uh, places in relationship to a historical context and in relationship to the kind of the infrastructure of care that has developed in these places. I don't know if I really answered, but this question, uh, maybe I'll, I can talk to Vincent later on, but, I, but at least that's how I understood her question. Well, I think that was a wonderful answer. And of course, um, it would seem as if the ecologies of war reach globally. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Fatima Liu, I think. Um, how do you plan to test these findings in other regions or war-ridden countries? Perhaps there will be a, an increased buy-in if the study can be broadened to other regions and countries. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's a that's a good point. Uh, the the main idea that we had was uh, was to really try to empirically produce some kind of evidence around this. So we wanted to actually sample, uh, uh, we take environmental samples from uh, areas that has been bombed and to check the validity of the, of the hypothesis that, that a heavy metal contamination is causing this, uh, uh, that is driving uh, some of this antimicrobial resistance. We're planning to do a cohort study uh, following uh, wounded the wounded over time and and see if 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 that uh, kind of uh, AMR development uh, can be analyzed uh, in a different way. Uh, we were also uh, doing experimental laboratory work where we're taking uh, bacteria and bombarding it with heavy metal and bombarding it with antibiotics and see what kind of uh, product comes out of that and then kind of map all this this in general and see if we can actually uh, make connections through this phylogenetic analysis and and this is all what is was in, was interesting is that was this was all driven by the anthropologists and the historians because we knew the 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 history of the region at least like i did and and other uh, some of my colleagues and and we were asking the kind of the the right question and so so 
to what extent it could answer that uh, maybe maybe this is one of the reasons that people uh, reacted to this but but there is a that was the experimental element of this uh, of this uh, work is that we wanted to cover triangulate our results looking at the patients looking at the environment and and looking at this archive of bacteria that we found in the labs and then producing some of that also uh, uh, in vitro and see what what kind of map, what kind of genealogy, what kind of kinship uh, map emerge from uh, from this study? And of course, this is all uh, superimposing that, or super, this is all superimposed. I mean, uh, on the history of movement of patients, the story of wounds, the the history of conflicts um, that could actually bring in this this human story into more uh, focus and link. Uh, between what we are seeing at the kind of the uh, microscopic level and and what we are seeing more at the at the social level. It's remarkable. Well, as somebody who's really tried to work between critical medical anthropology and social medicine, um, I think this really embodies that the the fruits of that relationship better than any I've ever seen. Now, I'm very pleased that my uh, colleague in anthropology and medical anthropology and a friend of yours, Stefania Pandolfo, is I think now. Um, with us as a panelist, I don't see her photograph, but if um, if she could ask her own question, that would be great. Can you hear? Are you? Uh, can you unmute Stefania? Oh yeah, I hi Omar. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to be special. I thought that there was going to be a panel, so I asked to be part of it. But uh, I just wanted to. This is a fascinating talk, and I I love the way you presented the different aspects as interconnected, having the biological taking on this much more complex life. I wanted you to develop uh, what you call the symbolic life of the wound in relation to what you said that you, you knew I was going to ask you. But, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, I, I was hoping to do that in a different talk, but uh, but I think one of the things that I um, uh, did over the past uh, few years was to document the experiences of uh, refugees and displaced population uh, moving uh, from, let's say, from Iraq to Syria, uh, from uh, from Syria to Lebanon, uh, from Iraq to Lebanon, and 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 what was really kind of uh, capturing me is that it was really it was interesting that there was these all these interesting. Um, um, uh, humanitarian interventions around resettling these refugees, identifying them with traumas and PTSDs. Um, so, so there was this really fascinating uh, uh, intervention that that was kind of doing this triage of of, of trauma uh, in in the, uh, in places like Lebanon and and other places. So. One of the things that I wrote about, and you know this piece, uh, uh, Stefania, uh, very well, is the idea that 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 uh, that in in places like Beirut uh, or in Lebanon, there has been a long history of of uh, different kind of populations with different kinds of grievances, from the Armenian population that moved to Lebanon uh, in the early 20th century to the um, uh, to the Lebanese who w went through the civil war to the uh, Lebanese who dealt with the Syrian occupation, with the, the Iraqis who came as refugees, to the Syrians who came as refugees, to the Syrians who were kind of being uh, uh, working in the country. So there was there were many grievances in these kind of societies with this his, with these complex histories of conflicts and overlayered over each other. So one of the things that I tried to do is to look at the the wound as a kind of a social and a symbolic. Uh, kind of uh, uh, at, the, at the social and the symbolic register, how people uh, uh, s speak about it, how people relate to each other in relationship to these kind of injuring, wounding and, and uh, each other, or at least kind of healing, repairing these wounds. Um, so, so some of this work has had kind of focused on looking at this kind of wound as the interstitial tissue uh, that connects people uh, together. Uh, because you know, I could empathize with someone else who ha who has gone through a similar experience, but also uh, that wound 
could become uh, toxic, could become something that that uh, impact these relationships, that could actually, uh, uh, you know, poison these relationships. So I looked at at at, at the at the wound as an, a useful analytic to look at this kind of social conflict and cohesion, and that's kind of constantly moving uh, around these histories of uh, trauma, uh, histories of uh, intergenerational um, uh, uh, wounds. Uh, so, so this is kind of how I try to address some of these issues, and I'm kind of planning to work a little bit more. I got kind of I, I wrote that uh, old piece, and then kind of got sucked into the uh, to the biological story uh, over over time. But I guess with in time, what I'm trying to do now is to come back to my own experiences living in Beirut and 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 witnessing all of these uh, incredible stories of people. Um, coming in and out of that place, and 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 this is the other thing that I would I would to kind of uh, highlight in the work is the uh, ephemeral element of and the transient elements of these wounds, how they come in and they go, uh, people come in and go of these places. Um, so so these are like kind of some of the problems that I was uh, trying to uh, to explore and and look at. Um, and, and for me, I'm locating a lot of this in in in, in social relations uh, more than anything else. I mean, there is there is a, an interesting history of the use of the notion of the wound in Iraqi uh, music, which is considered uh, one of the um, one of the saddest, really, and most uh, uh, solemn uh, form of singing in the Middle East. And there there is that part. Uh, being myself a little bit of a musician, uh, I've I've kind of uh, know I know this uh, this history a little bit and I'm I think it's kind of useful to open up some of the registers uh, that people use to speak about these grievances as a form of a wound so so I, I, I the main thing for me is not to essentialize these wounds and not to kind of try to um, uh, uh, create epistemological or ontological kind of uh, analysis of them. But I really, for me, the wound has been helpful as a method, uh, uh, thinking about uh, these societies that go through uh, long and protracted conflicts and through not only just uh, one place, but looking at a region and specifically what I'm uh, this, this area of the east of the Mediterranean, where people have been moving across that area for a really, really long time. And, and we see an intensification of that over the past uh, few decades. Thanks so much. I look forward to talking a lot more about this and even the intersection of the two of the biological right. history and this as in terms of the interstitial concept of the wound. But we'll yes. talk much more. This is fascinating. And, I, uh, and, and what you said about music actually could be one an opening to that yeah but i will withdraw here because i don't want to have a privileged place in this panel <laughs> thanks so much omar you're most welcome thank you stefania thank you stefania uh, we have a question from uh, martin uh, Bablowski, who says israel has some innovative approaches to wound therapy uh do you have any information about the ins incidence of amr there um a little bit uh there is uh, actually uh there is a kind of a hypothesis that this acinetobacter story uh, emerges as a big problem in Israel during the 1990s. And uh, there, this is something that just I just realized uh, kind of like a month ago. Uh, a friend of mine was doing this investigation and, and we talked a little bit about it. So I'm not really 100% um, knowledgeable about it but but you know one of the things that in where i live right now in brooklyn uh, there was a an acinetobacter uh, epidemic and i think it was 94 and and i think the main what what we know about that is that actually it probably came from uh, from some of the travelers who moved from uh, Israel to uh, the United States. So there is that history, which I think is is, is a kind of a, a little bit of a, a closed box for me at this point. Mainly when I was in Lebanon, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, and it's actually kind of against the law over there to also connect with any Israeli researchers. Uh, so so we're following some of these issues and, and they do have a, a, similar, a similar problem with Acinetobacter. And I think it's kind of interesting to, uh, to kind of open up that connection and see how uh, these, are they part of the same story or they're a different story. 
Great, thanks. Here's a, a question from an anonymous attendee, which uh, kind of parallels our current research sort of interest in multi-species ethnography and anthropology. Wondering about a One Health lens, mm -hmm. agricultural animals, maybe both sources of MDR development due to antibiotic overuse and also subject to the same environmental forces as humans, including war. Could broadening a lens of impact to include non-human animals add to the impacts and importance of this work? I, I think so. I think so too. I, I definitely, and that's something we thought about, uh, but I think because of like, you know, you just don't want to keep on opening up new doors at that point. And with the war setting specifically, what we wanted to look at is mainly urban environments uh, where, uh, I mean, of course, you know, people in urban environment also eat meat and, and that meat could be affected by antibiotics in general, but, but we wanted to kind of, uh, make, I mean, already it was such a kind of a broad and, and complex uh, formation in terms of this project, but I, but so we, that would have been, that would have been really a big stretch for us. And I think we would have needed to bring in more scientists to work on agriculture. Um, but, but definitely I, I, we all see this in relationship to this notion of one health, although I, I really have to say that it is still not very clear what that means. Uh, uh, one health, you know, it's kind of, there is a, a an, an idea of one health. And I think w this is where anthropology comes in. And this is where, uh, these, uh, the kind of this history of research that anthropologists have shown that, that yes, there are like, you know, there are, we might be sharing a certain kind of, uh, a global environment, but there are areas that experience a different kind of histories, uh, different, different kind of lo uh, local biologies. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this one health, but I think it is because it's new and it's kind of been now everyone is talking about it. And in terms of sustainable development, in terms of all kinds of international discourses, it is still a very vague and broad term that that yet to be uh, seen how it could be uh, translated into something uh, uh, very empirical and meaningful at the ground level. So but I, I think I think that point is is really, really important. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Um, I wonder if um, you could sort of talk a little bit um, to folks who are um, undergraduates or graduate students. I mean, as I suggested a bit in the introduction, your own history, right, has been written so much into the to making the very possibilities of this rich research, right. um, multiple forms of training, um, at the same time, not just narrow notions of professional training. But the incredible experiences um, that you've had working in these regions. How would you speak to potentially folks who are in the process of training and imagining their own futures? Um, how would people be able to engage in work which is as broad, as critical, and as creative as this, um, who may themselves not start from precisely that sort of range of experiences and, and professional right. modes right, of training? Right. Well, thank. I mean, it's 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 interesting because for me, uh, Charles, I never really thought about it that way. My my moving from disciplines, uh, not necessarily just because I was I was really like a just a kind of an inquisitive person who just wants to learn different skills, and I did actually uh, do that through my training. But actually, it was also part of my own survival as a, as a, someone who left actually i escaped iraq in the 1990s uh, running away from the from the dictatorship and uh, i was smuggled out to to beirut and in beirut i worked as a as an emergency doctor for in a hospital but then kind of decided to uh, that i became very disenchanted with uh, clinical medicine and wanted to actually probably either study family medicine or move into a different kind of direction. And I, I did a master's in public health with the hope to return back to clinical medicine as a family physician. I found in academia a very kind of uh, interesting, welcoming uh, platform that allowed me to um, Actually, because but mainly because I, as a doctor, I was also underpaid as a as a displaced doctor working in Lebanon. I was I think I was paid. Uh, I'm just trying to remember how much it was. Maybe three uh, hundred dollars a month, something like that. Uh, in ba in Baghdad before it was a it was a big uh, kind of a, a salary upgrade from the two dollars that I was getting in in Iraq as a as a kind of a newly graduate doctor. 
but but this kind of trajectory of trying to figure out my own survival, my own livelihood ended up taking me into different disciplines and also different places. Um, I, I got a scholarship to come to the United States. And, you know, I and maybe I, I'm saying this uh, the wrong place, but I actually got accepted both at Berkeley and at Harvard uh, when I applied in uh, 2001. And uh, ended up going to Harvard at that time, you know, uh, and and, uh, and it's amazing for me to be able to speak at Berkeley at this point. But but basically, uh, I arrived in the U.S. also at the uh, at just one month before 9-11. And and I so my whole graduate training became defined by this moment and by the the preparation for the Iraq, uh, the Iraq war and, of course, the invasion of Afghanistan. And I immediately decided that I that you know uh, that I that the, the, the it's going to be a big problem here for an Iraqi. I was the only Iraqi citizen at Harvard, so I you know thought that's going to be a lot of problems. Uh, so I applied for immigration to uh, to Canada, and I ended up moving to Canada and and uh, doing a postdoc and finishing my dissertation at Harvard, but I'm from, from Canada. And then at some point they wouldn't let me back to the United States. And there was like a big drama around that, but I'll spare you the details. Um, but, but that journey itself, um, uh, from Baghdad to Beirut, to Boston, to Montreal, back to uh, Beirut, now back to the United States has been part of a, a, an important journey of discovery, important, important journey. Uh, this has been kind of my way of understanding things too. It's been my lens to the world. It's by my, my lens uh, through my own experience to understand the complexities of uh, uh, cultural and social forms and, 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 and looking, at, uh, uh, looking at the intersection of all these disciplines that I went through and I worked in. My my main thing that I say to people when they ask me about this is that not people say oh your your work is very interdisciplinary, I try to say that it's kind of anti-disciplinary in many ways. I try to kind of get out of the, the idea of a discipline, and I think maybe maybe kind of historically that had been historically the case, and in time we've gone through more and more uh, specialization. So I feel like in this moment of time where everything is so subspecialized, we need more generalists. And, and I think this is nothing, nothing says that more than the current COVID-19 moment where, uh, where uh, that this country had kind of, uh, you know, you think that as, as Charles opened up with this anecdote, that this is the exception, this is the best system in the world. That is not really the case. Um, uh, you know, I've been I've been uh, struggling to get a vaccine here. Like the, the whole system is is reminding me of how, let's say, in, in Iraq, everything was falling apart, especially especially in the beginning of the pandemic. So so there is a there is a big problem that has uh, been unfolding across I think across many healthcare systems in the world, and 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 maybe the Iraqi case was this was this. Uh, ungovernability on steroids, maybe, but but this uh, but this unruliness of healthcare system has been has been happening across uh, different healthcare settings, and I think COVID really highlighted that. Um, we've seen this because of neoliberal uh, interventions. We've seen this because of war. We've seen this because of neglect and authoritarianism. But across the world, healthcare has has been whining or kind of on the on decline in terms of what we think as social medicine is or what we think is like the public good is and i think that is something that has kind of you know at least for me living and working in so many different uh, settings you realize the importance of stepping back looking through this kind of bird's eye view and saying here is the problem and this is what and this, the answer is very simple in many of these places um, so, so I think we've been creating, we've been sabotaging ourselves uh, by going into deep, more detailed uh, uh, solutions. Uh, some of these solutions could be uh, uh, dealt with in a much broader way. So, so what is really kind of for me is the, uh, uh, I think, I think having a a broader perspective on uh, problems, and and this is something that anthropology really. Uh, offered me and public health also offered me that but I think the other element is sticking close to the field sticking close to what's happening on the ground has been one of the most important uh, lessons that I learned over time 
And I think this is where clinical medicine and anthropology really, really come together. In both cases, you are very, very close to the kind of the individual and the social stories that are unfolding um, in, in, in the places you're living in. And I, I, and I feel that is something that could be um, a great lens into becoming, like, you know, at least what I, I, I like to still think of myself as a diagnostician <laughs> in the work that I do. Um, and this is this is the doctor in me that I was refusing to die out, although I've, I haven't practiced medicine in almost 20 years. Well, that's remarkable. I, um, it, um, I, I tell you, one of the genres that seems to have a lot of legs is um, physicians' memoirs. So mm -hmm. at some point when you, you know, if you want to take a little break between some of these uh, um, uh, book projects, that would be absolutely fascinating. I and mean, we think about multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, I kind of like your term antidisciplinary better. Um, <laughs> science, technology, society studies say that often the people who do the most creative research are thoroughly trained in at least two separate disciplines with very different understandings of what science is all about. Right. And I mean, here, your work seems to be a perfect example of that, of really having mastered medicine, actually also public health with its, its different set of assumptions, and then anthropology, and then being able to think about how those different assumptions potentially intersect. But one thing that STS has never um, identified is precisely what you said, which was this was not sitting around in a nice air conditioned or heated right. um, office, right. thinking about how these disciplines might be coming together. But it, as it was that war, dictatorship, and the problems of being able to treat patients, as well as, you know, very problematic bacteria going around the world were pushing you uh, in ways right. of being able to synthesize these. So I think that that is um, right. actually and, remarkable. And, and, and you know, to pick up from here, I think one of the things that I also try to do in the book, and, and you you nicely put it also, Charles, is is to show that this idea of life in general uh, is a, a much more complex story rather than looking at, you know, let's say modes of governance as a kind of a fait accompli uh, that this is about governmentality, this is about, but but actually to see the disorder within within uh, uh, everyday life and the disorder within power itself uh, is is something very useful is a useful lens to think about modes of governance that uh, they are they are themselves uh, disordered and at the at the core so 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 i think i think this kind of uh, perspective has helped also in in keeping things in a flow is a constant flow nothing really can be kind of contained by a category or or uh, there is this constant flow that you're trying to capture it's always fleeting and I think that is something that at least I learned from uh, from working through these different disciplines that's wonderful well I'll tell you some of us who um, unfortunately been roped into working on different epidemics and pandemics um, over a long period of time, but also have really thought about confronting, analyzing, confronting through practice, through policy, deep health inequities. This is a difficult moment when one feels as if so much of that work um, seems to, you know, you think now about the effects of COVID-19 within the United States, of the way in which in the words of medical historians and anthropologists like Charles Rosenberg, um, of really X-raying society in ways that really um, represent these deep sorts of problems. You know, one thing that was fascinating to me in your CV was that apparently you were the, the uh, founding uh, co-director of the Conflict Medicine Program mm -hmm. in the Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut. And I think you were working on this for something like seven years. Right. This sounds like a fascinating project. Could you tell us a bit more about right. that? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of the work I presented today around the wound and injury and following up uh, with with the AMR uh, it actually emerged from this platform, uh, which so I met this uh, uh, plastic surgeon or reconstructive surgeon really specialized in war trauma. And we both uh, we both began uh, thinking about how we can bring this history of experience of uh, of this region in terms of uh, conflict medicine you know there has been a lot of different wars in the region and you know the iran iraq war the civil war in beirut uh, uh, the Alge in algeria there is a long history of conflicts 
that were never being documented. They were never been, uh, you know, we never really learned what the lessons are from these places. So one of the things was a kind of a, 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 a it began as a project to try to document a the kind of the social and the biological dimensions of, of this history. Uh, we wanted to show what does, you know, what can the uh, medical experience of these doctors and of these uh, uh, in medicine could tell us, uh, inform uh, about uh, uh, war injury in general and how that's been, been changing. And also uh, contextualizing that in a kind of a historical, political, economic and social context. So, uh, so my colleague has been kind of really very active uh, working on his medical uh, work. You know, he published a book on reconstructive surgery. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, uh, we published together on on many uh, in many different journals, uh, working on even cancer and uh, war injuries in general. Uh, and and the and and what we did we presented the kind of the birth of this was in a conference that I organized with MSF uh, and uh, invited people from MSF to think about the region to think about kind of how do you integrate more academic work with the kind of the practitioners on the ground and that kind of uh, emerged as a kind of a, a, a collaboration with MSF and we kind of wrote this uh, together we wrote this something called the conflict medicine manifesto um, uh, I mean I can I can probably find it and share it uh, but but what we tried to show how uh, these new conflicts were defining uh, different experience of uh, of medicine uh, different experience of uh, of healthcare access um, and 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 that that platform became a, a very uh, interesting one where we did our first uh, global conflict medicine uh, conference where many speakers came from across the world and the, and and it, it it really flourished during this period that we 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 worked in unfortunately uh, my departure kind of uh, uh, happened and what the work still continued i was kind of dealing with things uh, from a distance but then my colleague also after the financial crisis in beirut and and the uh, and the beirut explosion uh, he he ended up kind of moving back to the uk and you know he's still kind of managing things remotely uh, in the program uh, so so now the the you know it's it's kind of ironic that the conflict medicine program ends after, because of these conflicts uh, and and the and, and but but I think I think this is where it's interesting to to insert these stories of failure also in the narrative of that experience and I think I'm I'm kind of open to talk about these things you, always because I think there's always lessons to be learned and I think you know you you do think different things in your life some of them work some of them don't but at least for me I still am committed to this idea and and I've been you know, talking with my colleague and, and documenting this, like this past 10 years of our work um, through a kind of this lens of conflict medicine. Uh, I'm speaking in some some other uh, venues on this experience, uh, especially uh, with a, an, a platform on global social medicine. Uh, so I'm presenting this experience of the conflict medicine program as a kind of a, as, as I said in the talk, a, a, a kind of a social medicine from the from the global south um but but it's it's there's a lot of lessons that i'm trying now until moving here and settling in just to kind of figure out how i'm going to be uh, documenting this history well uh, thank you so much i would like to thank all of the audience members who have um, participated with, with us today um the center for middle eastern studies always deborah lustig who manages to make all of these events work thank you so much um, and particularly you, Omar. Thank you so much for coming today um, and for giving that amazing talk and also for um, a range of different sort of um, other mini talks that you gave us in response to the questions. Thank you so much. We'll Thank save so a little much. bit more for your next visit to Berkeley. Yes. Take care. Thank you.